What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Vanguard. Got another great live stream for you all today. Another beautiful day here in Kansas City. And once again, we have a lot to talk about. Again, uh, ruining our attempt at a day off. Yeah, man. I mean, Jesus Christ. Uh, Joe Biden giving his absolutely radiant populist messaging at the fucking no, i can't even i can't even lead with the joke but the weather's nice out uh it's 85 degrees so we're just enjoying the icing on the poison cake that is climate change right now here in kansas city normally early in march it's still cold as shit here uh but it's 85 fucking degrees which is just absolutely insane uh, really soaking up all of that sunshine, but of course, still had to make some time uh, to bring you all the what's the haps on the internet, the good takes, the bad, uh, and all of the ugly. That is the Vanguard way. Uh, but beginning and ending every episode, we always shout out our patrons. What's up, patrons, Vanguardians, comrades? You're all comrades to us. Just hit that like button and the subscribe button and the little notification bell and all the irritating hoops YouTube makes you jump through so you can actually find our content. Yeah, huge shout out to the patrons. Uh, and thanks, Steve, for the chat. Nice cat, by the way. Beautiful, beautiful cat. Uh, but yeah, thanks so much to the patrons. You guys do make the show possible. If you uh, watching right now enjoy the content we create, please do consider contributing via uh, Patreon or PayPal. It really, truly helps us. It keeps us going. We couldn't do the show without you guys. And obviously, you guys know we're 100% viewer funded and we want to stay that way. So yeah, just a huge shout out to the patrons. Um, you guys make what we do possible. The link is in the description of this video if you'd like to join our patron page and find out about all the cool benefits we offer our patrons, like access to our exclusive Discord server, um, you know, ex uh, priority in our monthly Q&As, all that good stuff. So find out about that. And of course, a spot on the shout out screen, uh, which we show at the beginning and end of every video but yes yeah, sincere shout out to the patrons you guys do make the show possible if you enjoy the work we do and the content we create please do consider uh you know joining the patron supporting us on a monthly basis really really appreciate it also feel free to become a youtube member uh just added a whole new swath of pepe memes to the chat so if you guys want access to those as well as the other emojis then you can become a member another good way to support the show and have some fun while you're at it uh but yeah thanks everyone for tuning in today we're gonna have a great live stream before we get into the spicy drama uh the kyle kolinsky versus jimmy Dore beef which continues to escalate let's talk a little bit about the state of the union address um i tuned in for the majority of it last night uh, sat there, you know, wanting to die for about an hour and 15 minutes. Um, can't say I was terribly impressed. Did you get a chance to check out any of it, Zach? Yeah, I said I, I probably watched like the first 40 minutes of it. And then again, I also just I mean, I watched the highlight clips of maybe like a few things that I might have missed after that. But it was really long. Is it always this long? It feels long every time I watch. Actually, it, it, was it was shorter than usual this year. Yeah, well, that's fucked up because it felt really like it was just uh, like when uh, Joe Biden is just the least moving speaker of any president that we've had in modern time. I feel like he makes Donald Trump like uh, like, you know, he makes you uh, like thirst for some charisma for like something to watch. But it's, it's I don't know. I don't want to I don't want to, you know, jump the gun here. But yeah, woof. he just is so stale. He's so old. He's so like unput together at this point. Uh, and on top of that, I hated literally everything he had to say. So, yeah, this is a moment that's been going around for a while. Some Nancy Pelosi action. Uh, check this out, guys. This is some weird ass shit right here. I don't know what compelled her to do this. <laughs> Many of you have been there. I genuinely don't know times. what the fuck she's doing right there, guys. Uh, that's some weird shit, especially given the context. Biden He's talking about the war. Yeah, he was talking about like victims of uh, like veterans that have been victims of like burn pits and stuff like that. So uh, kind of a weird context to do that shit. It seems like she's like tripping balls or something. Just gets out. Of the, oh, like, what the hell is going on? Uh, yeah, it actually is creepy as hell. Like you say, hysteric writer. <laughs> Like when you're it's like a child that like overhears their mom and they think that they're getting McDonald's for dinner and then they find out that they're actually not getting McDonald's for dinner. So oh, oh no. <laughs> Sitting back down. I over I don't know. There's just like it's there's I mean, I can't even make jokes about it because it just looks like she's an insane person. Like if she was playing a villain in a horror movie, I would be horrified by that behavior. Like, could you imagine? Just imagine it's not the you know, floor of 
of the United States, you know, Congress or whatever the fuck that it's actually just like a, a, a all dark fucking basement with a dripping furnace. And you just see a uh, Nancy Pelosi. Yeah, she kind of looks like Gollum from Lord of the Rings or something. Uh, I'm also trying to find that video right now of Joe Biden. Yeah, here we go. Let's look at this one. Uh, Biden attempts to say Ukrainian ends up saying Iranian. Uh, check out Kamala's reaction in the background as it happens. This is fucking hysterical, too. Putin may circle Kiev with tanks, but he'll never gain the hearts and souls of the Iranian people. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, should I say something? <laughs> the Iranian people. Yeah, so between that and Nancy Pelosi's weird Smeagol-esque fucking high as fuck behavior uh that's that's the Democratic Party for you, the geriatric Democrats. Again, not to be ageist, but it's kind of hard to deny what we're looking at here. Not only that, but we have, uh, like, and we talk about this every once in a while when Dianne Feinstein makes the news or something. It's like, we know there are very influential people in the United States government, particularly the houses of, like, the House and Senate, right? Where we know they're getting Alzheimer's prescription because it's prescribed by the pharmacists for, that's literally just for them. It's multiple, you know, obviously there's a lot of speculation about the woman I just mentioned, Diane Feinstein. She definitely, you know, has dementia. I'm not a doctor. I can't say for sure, but like your, her behavior. Yeah. Gavin has it almost probably as a saved tab at this point. Cause we like to talk about it. Um, they're making the highest laws of the land and they might not even remember what happened yesterday. Yeah. Nancy Pelosi definitely doesn't remember what happened yesterday. Joe Biden doesn't remember what happened three minutes ago. The other day he thought it was 2020 again. Like, you know what I mean? I'm just saying. Yeah. And the fucked up thing is that I actually thought his speech was better than I expected. At least like he was actually, you know, more cognitively there than I expected, uh, which again, the bar is, is pretty goddamn low. Um, but he was actually in pretty fine form last night compared to how he usually is, which just tells you everything you need to know about how he usually is. It ain't looking good, folks. It ain't looking good. Uh, but, you know, jokes aside, there was some substance in the State of the Union dress that I wanted to address, not necessarily good substance, um, but just some, you know, things that I thought were worth addressing. This part particularly rubbed me the wrong way. If you guys follow the Vanguard on Twitter, uh, then you probably saw me tweeting up a storm about this. Um, but yeah, here's here's Joe Biden uh, with a needless slap in the face to the defund movement, not just the defund movement, but to the, you know, the movement against police brutality, uh, the movement for black lives, etc. Look at this fucking actually, this is when I first tuned into the speech before I rewound it and watched the rest of it. Uh, this is right where I jumped in and I was like, oh, my fucking God, here we go. Uh, here we go. We should all agree the answer is not to defund the police, it's to fund the police. I saw this before I even watched it. Fund them. We should all agree the answer is not to defund the police. Yeah, but what's crazy to me about this is like, who is pretending that... We're not funding the police. Like, that's like, Ben Burgess actually tweeted this and I saw it. Like, who is this for? Who is this for? It is for no nobody except for people who want to see progressives get kicked in the teeth, basically. Because, you know, in the point that Ben Burgess made, not that one, was that he said, you know, hey, anybody who was skeptical of the Democrats for thinking that they that Joe Biden wanted to defund the police, him saying this in his state of the union address, it doesn't change their mind. Nobody that was like, oh, these Democrats and they fucking hate the police tuned in tonight. And they were like, oh, after this time, Joe Biden told me that, you know, not when he wrote the 1994 omnibus crime bill that incarcerated, uh, what, what is it like one in every like 12 black men have been fucking arrested now, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We know all the horrible crimes, 5% of the population, 25% of the earth's prisoners. Okay. Okay. All Joe Biden. No, no. Him taking a pot shot at progressives after he's followed none of his fucking campaign promises. That's what's going to change their mind. Absolutely fucking pathetic. This was also the first thing I saw. And I think it 
it was also just because Gavin tweeted about it and we started to get notifications. <laughs> yeah, I was pissed off. I'm like, what the fuck, dude? And yeah, it's absolutely crazy. What a slap in the face to criminal justice advocates. Um, and thank you, by the way, CEB Applejack 59 for the two bucks. Uh, Kyle is daft. Biden is being populist. We're about to get to that. So hold your horses, hold your horses. And thank you, uh, Cheryl, for the 20 bucks. You're making my day. Thanks for the much needed laughs. Well, thank you, Cheryl. Really, really appreciate the 20 buck donation. Very generous and glad to hear that you're enjoying the show, bringing a little bit of levity to an otherwise absolutely depressing media landscape. But yeah, uh, yeah. This is oh, anyway. oh, I was just going to thank the for the. Bah, thank you, Cheryl. Sorry, your <laughs> super chat disappeared. But yeah, no, uh, it, it, we, we have a lot to talk about and we're going to get into the Kyle Kalinske shit because that was also that was the second thing I saw in relation to the State of the Union address. And, and yeah, of course, I was not happy about that either after I watched what unfolded. <laughs> Right, right. And and by the way, just in case I know the volume was a little bit low on that clip I played, he said, uh, we should all agree the answer is not to defund the police. The answer is to fund the police uh, to, you know, insane applause from his own party members. So basically, in case you were under some other illusion uh, and you thought that the Democrats was like a progressive party or something. No, this is what they stand up and applaud. Uh, funding the police. By the way, the police never actually got defunded in the first place. Uh, so he's basically just talking about giving them more money. Uh, and just to you know drive home that point, let's take a look at this graph here. Um, this is Los Angeles, but obviously LA is a completely Democrat-run city, so I think it's pretty you know emblematic. Uh, the, as you can see here, the police budget is almost double, not quite double, but it's far and away the highest allocation of resources compared to human resource benefits, not even halfway there. Um, and as you guys know, LA is one of the cities that has the biggest homeless problems in the entire um, country as far as tent cities and um, unhoused people go. So uh, maybe that money should be going to giving them houses. Maybe that money should be going to giving desperate people a way out of their desperation, therefore lowering crimes of desperation. Just a thought. I'm not a you know expert political ana analyst or anything, but just a thought. Uh, anyway, and you know. also just to stay on that point for a second, because if the solution was not defunding the police, right, if the answer was funding the police, wouldn't the cities with the most expensive police budgets per capita be the safest cities in America? That's not the case. New York City also, I imagine, has a very similar um, bu budget allocation to this. I know they're about to spend, this is absolutely absurd. They're about to spend more money. And this is why we told you Eric Adams was a fascist. He was going to do shit that even the Blasio didn't want to do. Uh, they're going to spend more money on police watching, uh, people stealing fares on the subway. than they actually make from lost ticket fares from people but they want to make sure nobody can sleep on the subway anymore they want to make sure that they are making life as agonizing and miserable as possible for uh the you know impoverished class right which is just what i'll refer to anybody that you know fucking you know can't pay for a fucking subway ticket right i mean it's ridiculous and if it, but no the cities where the crimes are highest is also funny enough where they're spending the most on police but it's also where inequality is the highest okay the I, we were just looking at a chart the other day that showed that in new york city you have to spend like five grand a month on a one bedroom one bathroom apartment in new york city in manhattan okay that's the average price uh in uh uh los angeles i think it's a bit lower i think it's like 3800 to four grand um but Los Angeles is a little bit bigger. That's why the Manhattan real estate is so fucking astronomically expensive. But anyway, I'm getting off on a little bit of a hill here. But there's absolutely no data to suggest that funding the police more uh, reduces crime, reduces, um, you know, anything related to the police at all uh, that they could solve. 100% correct. And thank you for another super chat. Applejack, 59, two bucks. Cops solve 2% of major crime, says Google. Uh, that sounds about accurate. At least at least 90% of a cop's job is just punishing poor people for being poor, as I always like to say. Uh, a, a law is not really a law for rich people if the crime is a penalty, is a, if the crime is a fine. Sorry, I fucked that up. But yeah, if the penalty for a crime is a fine, then it's not a crime for the rich. It's only a crime for the poor. Uh, therefore, a cop's job is basically at least 90% just harassing and punishing poor people for being poor. Um, in case you weren't aware, I'm, I'm, I know that most of you guys aren't like, you know, police simps in our audience or whatever, but just in case you weren't aware. And also just a quick shout out, uh, Corey Bush does seeming, is seemingly the only person that's still, you know, repping the defund slogan, the defund message. 
Um, obviously have a lot of issues with Corey Bush and the way she's, you know, conducted herself as a representative. It's been pretty disappointing to say the least. And I wish she would, you know, be more aggressive towards Biden and, you know, more, uh, you know, on top of this, but at least she did come out with a statement at all. She says, with all due respect, Mr. President, uh, you don't need to mention saving black. You didn't mention saving black lives once in the speech. All our country has done is given more funding to the police. The result, 2021 set a record for fatal police shootings, defund the police, invest in our communities. So again, I wish she was a little bit more aggressive. I wish she spoke out against Biden more. Uh, but that being said, she is 100% correct here. And as you were mentioning, Zach, all we've done is give more funding to the police. And the result is, you know, the most fatal year for police shootings on record. Um, so shout out to Corey Bush for being the only congressional representative, seemingly. And maybe they mention it every once in a while. But Corey seems like the only one that still remains firm in her resolve and refuses to give up on the defund movement, um, which is, you know, based. Although, again, she could be doing more. Yeah, it's. It seems to be the, I mean, it makes sense, right? Uh, Cori Bush, for people who don't know her backstory, she came up as an activist after, um, you know, the uh, police protests in Ferguson, Missouri, not too far from where Gavin and I record this podcast just a couple hours away on I-70, uh, right outside St. Louis. Uh, obviously, we, you know, you guys are familiar with the story, but that was some life-changing shit, I imagine. It changed my life from, you know, two and a half hours away. It was one of the first stories I covered seriously for my school paper. It made me really think, you know, about all that kind of stuff in a, in a meaningful, deep way. I think for a lot of us uh, of my generation, I was like, what, 16 years old when that was happening. So it was like really, you know, a, a push right before Bernie Sanders into the world of politics. And uh, I think for Cori Bush, she had a, such an intense, um, you know, and obviously she's a black woman. She's grown up in America. Like, I just feel like it seems like that's, you know, gonna, uh, made such an imprint impression on her as an activist that, you know, she's still able to carry that rhetorically. Um I wish that she would advocate for other things uh, like she still advocates for defund the police, even though they're really, uh, you know, even though they might be called unpopular. But at the end of the day, it is a little bit of a bummer that all we're getting is rhetoric. You know what I mean? Um, even though we're not getting any of that rhetoric anymore from people like AOC. So, um, you know, it, it still sho shows her uh, or shows that she's a slight cut above the that. But um, I don't know. We're splitting hairs at that point, in my opinion. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Let's get on to this next issue, this next little uh, piece here, which is related to Jimmy Dore and Kyle Kalinske. I think it's probably safe to say that Jimmy and Kyle's friendship is uh, over and, and done for. There's no repair in sight. It's it's just simply uh, not going to happen. They're in, you know, they're it's beyond that at this point. It's gotten too ugly, and at this point, it's almost a sport, seemingly, for Jimmy Dore to you know, dunk on Kyle uh, and, you know, among a lot of people, not just Jimmy, but definitely among Jimmy. I think Jimmy really savors these. Op okay. Before we get into this, let's address a couple of super chats. Thank you. Applejack uh, defund the cops doesn't resonate. They will not reform what cops do so they can say uh, they defunded and it doesn't work. I think it would absolutely work if you took a fat amount of that budget and reallocated it into social services, which would prevent people from being in the state of desperation, which uh, would then foster them committing crimes of desperation. That's just my opinion, but appreciate that five yeah. bucks. I kind of see where he's coming from, though, because I also understand that the structure of policing itself also has to change. So even if you take away their money, it would definitely mitigate their harm. But I mean, I also see what you're saying. Where those any funding that's left for those police, they're going to use it to terrorize fucking communities. They're going to use it to target black guys. Like, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that argument too. But yeah, it, it, taking away their money and giving it to other people so it gives them less of an opportunity to be on the street predators, which is essentially what the police are, right? Gain control of our streets uh, using violence, intimidation, and the threat of fucking locking you in a cage with, uh, you know. That's what we use to keep our state like stable society. So, yeah, I definitely agree and am sympathetic to your point. If what you're the point you're making is that you know even if we defund the police, we still have to radically alter the structure of policing. Um, but I don't think you would get an argument on that from here. Right, and that's totally fair to say. And and obviously, you know, if if Biden was saying like you know I don't like the term defund the police, but I'm going to talk about uh, demilitar demilitarizing the police, for example, I would be okay with that. Like, I'm okay if you change up the slogan number, even if you talked about serious police reforms, it would have been one thing, but uh, he didn't at all. All he said was fun to the police. So anyway, thanks for the super chat. Also, thank you, Christopher, for the 10 bucks. Hey guys, we disagree on a bit, but not going to lie. You've gained a viewer used to cast y'all off as Jimmy door slash gray zone apologist, but pure ignorance on my part. Y'all have been kicking ass lately for real. Thanks so much, Christopher, for the 10 bucks and for the kind words. Yeah, we definitely pride ourselves on being basically like 
one of the only YouTube channels in this in this scene uh, that's willing and able to uh, to criticize both like the TYT Vosh left and like the Jimmy Dore Gray Zone left. Uh, again, not a lot of channels out there that aren't playing for a team. We pride ourselves in being one of the few. Yeah, that's kind of the and you know, and we also appreciate having a heterodox audience of people that want to push back on us. You know, like uh, I like being able to have a guy like Lance on our show and not have everybody like have a con complete conniption fit, and then have a guy like Glenn Greenwald on our show and have everybody not have a complete conniption fit. Like I just like to talk to different people, different ideas, and yeah, Kevin and I are on our own island. Um, so whether you know, some days we'll be praising Jimmy, some days we'll be ripping the fucking shit out of him, and that goes for Breaking Points, Kyle Kalinsky, Vosh. And sure as shit, it goes for TYT, though. I cannot remember the last time I had to praise it. Yeah, it's definitely tough to find a good reason to. They're not homophobic over there, I guess. That's <laughs> Jink did a pretty good interview with uh, Ro Khanna a couple times yeah, recently. That would be my one area of praise for TYT. But again, it's it's few and far between. And yeah <laughs> but yeah thank you so much christopher for the 10 bucks really appreciate the fact that you're enjoying the show thank you also gabriel ross nash for the five bucks jimmy doesn't have friends jimmy just has enemies and frenemies i mean you're kind of not wrong there he has friends that are only one uh fuck up away from being his enemy uh, as long as till you say one one word of dissent then you're an enemy <laughs> yeah do you remember when jank uger was his friend guys do you remember when ron placone and graham elwood were his friends oh yeah all they did was have like all, all ron and graham had to do was start fucking disagreeing with them and you had to get yo oh, put your torch out on survivor jds show okay i'm just saying guys and of course it's gonna happen if fucking max blumenthal or aaron Maté step out of line and stop giving him the iv drip of whatever the fuck he wants to hear from them that's exactly what's gonna happen that's why he has a new sicko fan like fucking whatever rating whenever he wants to go like some random asshole you've never heard of it's like hey this is the guy that's gonna be speaking as my guest now because i fired the guys that i actually i actually you know helped me build this show I uh, actually wrote a bunch of my actually funny jokes and then I just cast them aside. Fuck that. No. Yeah, I've got some criticisms. Yeah, who the fuck is that new guy on the Jimmy Dore show that I, I always see? His name's like Kurt or something. He has like the personality of like a piece of white bread. Uh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, anyway. He agrees with Jimmy on everything. So I think yeah, we know why he's the criteria for, for being Jimmy's, you know, co-host or whatever. Got to agree on literally everything. Anyway, we're getting off track. We got to get into the story. But thank you so much, Gabriel. And thank you also. Uh, hashtag China is the future for the two bucks. Hello, 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 hello. Uh, but yeah, let's hello, finally. Hello, hello, <laughs> Is there anybody in there? Uh, I but yeah. you can hear me. <laughs> I'll just turn this into a karaoke of Pink Floyd. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay let's get into this guys we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do it we're gonna actually do the segment now um jink and jimmy are, that's actually true they are two sides of the same coin in many many respects that is a hundred percent true they are both uh narcissists for sure uh, and actually i think their response to kyle kalinsky show illustrated that when kyle you know went out of line and, and decided to give a nuanced take criticizing both of them when push came to shove uh they both apparently blew up behind the scenes totally excised him from their communities or friendship circles or whatever uh completely putting you know their petty beef above any sort of actual you know personal friendship like you know if one of our friends of the show like you know, socialist MMA or like Kamali or Savvy Sabs, or if one of them like put out a video, uh, you know, talking shit on the Vanguard and being like, hey, here's an area of disagreement. I'm going to criticize you. Uh, do you think I would like call them up and like blow up and be like, how fucking dare you criticize me in the Vanguard? You fucking traitor. Uh, you're never allowed on my show and I'm never talking to you again. Obviously not. Uh, cause I'm an actual, like reasonable adult. It's not a petty narcissist and it's not just trying to excise everyone from my life that doesn't a hundred percent agree with me and like lick my asshole. Anyway. Yep. Anyway, let's get into the story guys. We're, we're, uh, we're stalling. We're stalling. Um, yeah. He was let's pretending get some meat and potatoes. All right, yeah, I want to start talking. Potatoes. <laughs> Only so much longer we can put it off. All right. Kyle Kalinske comes out here. With a banger tweet, just kidding. Uh, with this tweet, Biden going full populist in this speech, strong state of the union. And I do want to be fair to Kyle. We're going to give all of his context and other opinions and all that stuff. But on its face, yeah, not not the best tweet. And like I said, I watched the state of the union address. Um, it was not it was not very populist. I mean, whatever populism was in it was just obvious posturing. 
and talking about how he was going to essentially pass the various provisions of the Build Back Better bill, even though we already saw how he completely failed to fight for those provisions. Uh, so you can't really you know, brag about how you're going to pass provisions to a bill that we just saw you fold on like mere months ago and gave the weakest, you know, offense of all time. Anyway, so yeah, Kyle's tweet here. This got, you know, this got a lot of responses. I thought this was pretty funny. A uh, friend of the show, Socialist MMA. This was probably my favorite response right right here. Um, and again, to be fair to Kyle, um, the dude did post some other tweets criticizing the state of the union. I'll try to find him. Um, it wasn't like it was all positive. Um, I don't even know. He talks about how they didn't include a line about stock trading, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, um, yeah, not the best tweet. Definitely was not going. It definitely to comes off like simping for sure. Yeah, yeah. And and again, Joe Biden could have used the State of the Union address to do something seriously bold, seriously populist. Like he could have taken the taken the time to uh, to uh, announce that he was decriminalized or uh, legalizing weed. That would have been awesome. Or what about uh, canceling student loan debt? He could have come out there and said, hey, guys, the nation's eyes are on me and I'm here to announce that I'll be liberating a generation economically by axing their student loan debt. Uh, or he could have said, hey, guys, it's time to take cannabis off of the schedule one. Um, it's time to, you know, free all the nonviolent drug offenders. Uh, in that case, I would have you know, been totally accurate to say that Biden is going full populist in this speech. Um, and I know that some people are saying this is sarcasm, but as we'll see in a second, yeah. you no, know, it was not sarcasm. Although, again, to give credit to Kyle, his take is more nuanced than what is presented here in this tweet. And that's kind of one of the problems with Twitter is that, you know, you're trying to, you know, get out a pithy little message in under 180 characters or whatever. And a lot of times you lose a lot of nuance. Again, not to defend this take. I, I don't agree with it, obviously. But I do think if you listen to Kyle's full commentary on the situation, you'll understand the point he was making better. And we'll play that in a second. Uh, but did you have any comment on this before we get to Jimmy Dore's response? Yeah, dude, this is such – it's a bad tweet, right? And it's just poor political analysis because as much as you try and give him the benefit of the doubt, there's just no excusing this from a guy that's been fucking doing this game for so long, <laughs> misreading this card so badly. I mean, Kyle – like – Kyle, you know what the fuck is going on. This is all empty rhetoric. I've heard you lambast politicians so many times for only wanting to talk about shit and never wanting to do anything. Why would you try and give Joe Biden a fucking W right now? Like, this is so weird. Why are you not pissed off uh, that all it is was a retreading of the boulevard of broken dreams of shit he said he was going to give us 12 months ago, Kyle? What the fuck, man? There wasn't any populism about that. That was called bullshitting. That's what that was. Populism? No, that was lying to your constituents. Next, Kyle's going to be like, yeah, I really like when politicians tell me that they support good things and oppose bad things. No fucking shit, man. Like, it just, it, I'm, I was shocked, dude. I cannot, I don't know how you retain that from the one understanding the performance of Joe Biden up until this point where he has failed to do one single populist thing his entire presidency. And now he goes and he talks about how he wants to pass some provisions of a handout to fucking billionaires mostly. And oh yeah, we're going to try and sprinkle in some good stuff too. Yeah, that's the populism I want to hear. No, it sounds like fucking Barack Obama. And remember how we spent the last 10 years fucking blowing our brains out, criticizing how horrible that was for our country. You did it too, Kyle. What the fuck? I just don't understand. Yeah, no, I think that's totally fair. Um, and again, is this really the left flank of the Democratic Party at this point? Like, you know, giving Biden like faint praise for doing the absolute bare minimum in his shitty State of the Union address while meanwhile doing absolutely nothing as uh, the executive when he has so much power. Um, anyway, you know, it is just a tweet. Let's see what Jimmy Dore responded. He says, if I was this dumb, I'd want to punch myself in the face. Same. Yeah, I mean, honestly. Same. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so Jimmy coming out here. Again, it doesn't seem like there's any hope of repairing Jimmy Dore and Kyle Kalinske's friendship at this point or any sort of, you know, a professional relationship. They're, they're totally done for. And it doesn't seem like Kyle responded to this at all. Um, not that I could find at least. Uh, it seems like he's just going to ignore Jimmy from here on out and let him take his shots uh, again while ignoring it. Um, but yeah, let's actually listen to Kyle's take on this. I did want to play it just to be fair to the man. This is his comment. Did you want to say something? Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, this is his commentary last night on the Breaking Points panel. Um, let's take a listen because, again, Twitter can sometimes be a little bit 
um, unnuanced, a little bit reductive. So let's take a listen to his full words here and we can, you know, parse through what we actually agree with and disagree with. So I guess let's just start, Kyle, with you. What are some of the top uh, recollections from, you know, obviously Ukraine was the top news, but general breakdown of the speech, I think it clocked in around an hour and 10 minutes on the shorter side of a state of the union. What were your general impressions here? So I got two things that I thought were very negative, And then one thing that I thought was positive, sure. uh, the negatives are he was stumbling and bumbling a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I mean, optics, no taking away from that. Listen, it's, it's hard to watch. There's just right. no denying that. Yeah. So that was a negative. Um, the other negative thing was, especially in the second half of the speech, it was just a lot of standard politician fluff. I was getting really quickly. I thought it was hilarious how, again, like you, you said you expected it to be worse, but I, th- I, th- I still want to point out how everybody cannot get over how bad of a public speaker that Joe Biden is. Like, I'm sure they had him on like dialed right in on the right, like medication for the evening. But yeah, I, I can't, I hate listening to him because I, I, maybe th- this is going to come across as slightly ableist, but I hate listening to people like bumble and fuck up their way through like a rant or a fucking, you know, f- speech or some, any kind of oration. I don't know. I thought it was unfucking listenable, but anyway. So aggravated because he was going down basically his list of build back better right. uh, agenda items. And he was saying, we got to do this. We should do this. We should do that. You didn't get build back better passed. You didn't propose standalone bills on that. You didn't break out your executive order pen to do any of that. So it's just literally a virtue signal speech. That's all it is. Yeah. And so I was really frustrated. It's almost like the more you know about politics and the more angry you get because you're like, I know that this is all just fake and theater and it's not like yeah. we're actually going to do these things. Yeah. But I will say the one positive thing is the speech was, especially for the uh, first half or so after the Ukraine stuff, it was very populist. Mm-hmm. So he did sort of lean in on the, we got these new factories now opening up in Ohio and in Michigan, semiconductor factories and some other factories. And um, that's how you made the comment uh, Sagra, as we were watching, like, that's exactly something Trump would have done. Yeah, and it's a great, and, it was a great, it was a great. Yeah, exactly. That it's, that means it's not fucking like what, opening factories, Kyle. That's the new definition of populism. Like Ron DeSantis runs around and talks about how he's opening a bunch of fucking new factories in Florida. Are you going to talk about how based his populism speeches are? No, because you actually care about the policy that goes behind it. You just said it was all fluff. It was all fluff because it's not real. Why does why are, I don't understand that logic. How do you make that jump from saying everything correctly to then just coming out and being like, well, that was still pretty good, even though it was all a lie. Like, what? And that is smart politics. I love how he leaned into the Buy America stuff. Um, so the only positive stuff is it was a lot more populist than I thought it would be. But the negatives, again, stumbling and bumbling and just standard politician fluff. So I like that he First lied to us, but I'm bummed that it was all lies. That was what I take away from Kyle's analysis. What the fuck, dude? Like, I don't understand. Like, try and explain it to me, Gavin, because like, I, I don't understand. I mean, I guess the most charitable interpretation of Kyle's comments about the populism is just that he's saying, like, you know, from a from a political analysis standpoint, not including my opinion or his opinion. But I think he again, the most charitable interpretation is that he's saying, like, you know, if I was a political analyst or if I'm, he is a political analyst, then he did a good job like communicating the populist tendencies of the democratic agenda when it comes to buy America, when it comes to like, you know, building things in America. Um, again, maybe that's not actually happening, but I think Kyle might've just been saying like, uh, you know, this is the kind of message the Democrats should be embracing if they want to win. Um, so again, just as far as like removing his opinion, but just giving an analyzation of the politics of it and how good or bad Joe Biden potentially is connecting with the people. Maybe, you know, like, yeah, lean into those talking points if you want to succeed. Uh, But again, that's that's about the most charitable interpretation. I agree that, yeah, it's it definitely was not populist. Uh, Again, I think he was maybe just pointing out that, yeah, it was politically correct, not politically correct, but you know what I'm saying? It was a good move politically for Biden to lean into those talking points rather than other ones i don't know yeah i guess so i just don't yeah i don't know I, oh i want to bring factories back home yes that's what i want to see populism in the like every fucking president says that regardless like ronald reagan doesn't consider him a populist so, you go listen to reagan's speeches he doesn't talk in the state of the union about how fucking oh he fired all of the airline air traffic controllers and fucking you know closed down no we opened 64 new factories right outside this year, Jim. Virginia, you know, whatever the fuck. That's not how Ronald Reagan sounded, but you guys understand what the fuck I'm talking about. Just like, <laughs> anyway, yeah, uh, definitely not the best look for Kyle. 
Uh, just to address a couple super chats real quick. Thank you, Brian, for the 499. Kyle's takes on military aid to Ukraine and Russia, along with his praise of Biden, raised questions about his leftist credentials. Thanks for the 499. Thank you, Applejack. I also thought he had a relatively not that great take about Russia, but it's a, it's not the worst I've seen. That's why we haven't talked about it. But Yeah. Uh, thank you, Applejack, for the uh, two bucks. There is no left in the Democratic Party. This is very true, as Biden's speech proved. Um, breaking points takes a hawkish line on Russia. We've talked about that. We had Glenn Greenwald respond to that. Um, thank you also once again, Applejack, for the five bucks. Kyle, uh, how do you go from this flop? Or how do you go from this is fluff to this is populist? It's all fluff and he knows it. Uh, yeah, again, in the most charitable interpretation, he's saying as far as the substance goes, it was fluff. As far as the rhetoric went, it was populist. And you could say the same thing about Trump. You know, a lot of people said, yeah, Trump presented himself as a populist, even though when push came to shove, it was all establishment fluff. So, you know, again, in the most charitable, charitable interpretation, Kyle was saying rhetorically it was populist. As far as the actual substance, it was fluff. Yeah, and honestly, guys, you guys were like, oh, you guys are about to just hate on Jimmy even though you freaking said you disagreed with Kyle. No, guys, I actually thought that Jimmy was hilarious right there. That was the kind of content that make, that reminds me of why I really enjoyed Jimmy, the guy that's holding the line for authentic fucking left-wing principles. When that's happening, you'll never hear me uh, bitch about Jimmy Dore. I, 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 I thought that was funny as hell uh, when I saw that tweet about it. If I was this dumb, I'd want to punch myself. And that's a good old-school comedy. That's what I like from uh, Jimmy Dore. Uh, and yeah, yeah. Um, so definitely got to say if we're for keeping tallies, they got to have one over there. That was an L for Kyle. Yeah, no, it definitely was not a great tweet. I'm not denying that at all. Uh, but yeah, let's move on to our next story. Unless you had any other commentary on that one, Zach. I uh, did want to move on to uh, Jesse Ventura's tweet. The great Jesse Ventura, former governor of Minnesota, currently an RT contributor. He comes out here to reassert his principled stance against war once again putting his uh, job on the line. So he says, 20 years ago, I lost my job because I opposed the Iraq war and the invasion of Iraq. Today, I still stand for peace. As I've said previously, I oppose this war, this invasion, and if standing up for peace cost me another job, so be it. I will always speak out against war. Uh, so again, if you guys aren't familiar, Jesse Ventura used to work in MSNBC uh, back during the days of the Iraq war, and he was essentially let go because he made clear that he wasn't going to tamp down on his anti-war rhetoric. He wasn't going to stop telling the truth about our invasion of Iraq. Uh, and now he's going on to say that once again, he's basically putting his job on the line. Now he works at RT um, to criticize the war going on in Ukraine. And of course, if you guys have been following Jesse, you'll know that he's you know also laid out a lot of the context as far as the NATO expansion and Western aggression, which definitely laid the groundwork for this war. Um, but still, it's pretty goddamn based, in my opinion, pretty legendary. Uh, the, again, once again, he's putting his principles above profit, uh, sac risking you know, losing his job and along with it, his health care, presumably, in order to take an anti-war stance. So I thought this was pretty badass. Oh, of course, dude. It's amazingly badass. And as you pointed out, for people who don't know, you know, he works for fucking RT, man, you know, uh, he had to come out and say exactly what he was going to say when he was from SNBC and they wanted him to support the war. We don't know if RT wanted him to support the war, but we kind of want to know what the fuck they probably wanted right behind the scenes, at least of the big umbrella. Uh, and he's like, nope, fuck that. I don't support any war. I don't support any invasions. I don't support any occupations. Uh, I've been in the military. I know what that's like. I don't support any fucking, um, you know, war. And he's, Stood by that fucking principle. Um, you know, he was the, one of the highest growing and rating shows on MSNBC uh, uh, at the start of the Iraq war when he was pulled from uh, their show. And now he's on RT, which gets infinitely less ratings than he would have gotten uh, on MSNBC. And he could have been a really fucking popular show on mainstream media, guys. He has a lot of charisma, a very unique uh, worldview. Uh, I think a lot of people would have dug it. That's why he was able to, as a third party candidate, win the fucking governorship of Minnesota. Okay. And also become a professional wrestler. Okay. Uh, he, now, uh, assuming he, you know, he sticks his neck out again and he loses his show at RT, not that that's going to happen, but if he did, he's certainly risking that speaking out. Uh, it would just keep that anti-war voice smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, which is why, um, you know, they try and intimidate people into uh, uh, being jingoists and Jesse Ventura will not be intimidated. So based as shit as always. Yeah, 100% based as fuck from Jesse Ventura. Shout out to the great Jesse Ventura. 
And absolutely, we would obviously at any point love to have him on the show. I know some people were suggesting that in the chat. Uh, obviously, we'd love to have Jesse on the show at any point. We were huge advocates that he run for president as well as a Green Party or independent candidate. So obviously, I'm about I'm 100% down from that idea as well. Um, thank you, Applejack, once again for the five bucks. If we're supposed to hear all sides of the story to know the truth, uh, then what does it mean to ban RT on social media? Yeah, I mean, I thought that it was pretty insane, the fact that RT has been banned on several social medias. What 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 are the social medias, Zach? Do you remember that they've been banned from? I know it's been like a couple streaming services or something. Yeah, so anything that's owned by Google, they're banned from. So YouTube, Google, uh, and then I think that, I want to say it's like a couple of str like like uh television services and stuff too because i saw i think it was like george galloway the former mp that has a show on rt uh tweeting about how in it was like he was his rt got cut also because he's obviously not living in america in america you can still access it everywhere but uh yeah i i think it's a broad collaboration between what we would all collectively understand as big tech if you're one of the big techs i think they're participating in the censorship at least in the eu which is where i know it's strongest absolutely absolutely and there's one more uh clip i wanted to react to actually from the breaking point state of the union panel their live coverage from last night they had marion williamson on the show and guys marion williamson is you know someone who i disagree with a fair amount of the time but also someone who gets it 100 percent right a fair amount of the time and i actually thought what she offered to the conversation last night on breaking points was invaluable something that not enough people are saying or talking about so let's take a quick look at that real quick and react because again i think she's 100 percent on point here and i'm glad to see someone uh, bringing this to the conversation it should be at the absolute forefront of the conversation um in my opinion but yeah let's take a look at this and react also really quickly just to because i see a lot of dissent in the comment section it's the eu where rt is banned on youtube not america that's why you guys can all see it gotcha and and yeah obviously there's you know very propagandistic elements of RT. Obviously, a lot of their coverage is going to be extremely skewed in favor of the Russian perspective. That is true. Um, but that doesn't mean they should be banned or censored, in my opinion. Uh, you know, I, just like how I don't think NPR should be banned or BBC should be banned uh, when they're talking about their country's, you know, war crimes and, and whitewashing the wars that their countries are involved in. I don't think those, you know, outlets should be censored. Uh, and out of a principled stance, I also don't think that R uh, RT should be censored. Um, anyway, that's my opinion. I know a lot of people feel uh, a strong way about it. But yeah, let's take a listen to this clip. Again, this is Marianne Williamson on Breaking Points. Let's check it out. Marianne, something I'm curious about as a, as a former presidential candidate, we were discussing this idea that Biden wasn't telling an interconnected story about America in the context of Ukraine, COVID, and just the broader economic issues you're describing. What what story, especially tonight, would you would you tell? Well, if you're talking about what's happening in Ukraine, this is the story as I see it. The big story in all this, in addition to all the things which I did feel he articulated very well, we have been told for many, many years that we didn't have to worry about a nuclear war because of the, the principle of mutually assured destruction. Well, guess what, everybody? That only works if you're talking with what they now call rational actors. Mm -hmm. You get a nuclear bomb in the hands of somebody that you don't think is that mentally stable, and the entire principle goes down, goes down the drain. On, this, on the other side of this, and I agree with the president, we will get to the other side of this. And I hold, I see Ukraine as he did. I hold Ukraine in my prayers as he did. I'm inspired by Ukraine as he did. But we all know that an entire post-World War II era, it's over. This whole thing is going to have to be reimagined. And we are going to have to reimagine, we are going, what's going to happen? It's all going to be about nuclear bombs now. Some people are actually going to use this experience to say more countries should have nuclear bombs. What we have to stand for is total nuclear non-proliferation. Uh -huh. When I was a young person, we used to go to protest, ban the bomb. We just, now we gave up on the whole thing. Well, this was a big wake up call. We have to reimagine what we want, both for our democracy and on the other side of this war. We're living at a time of two simultaneous phenomena. Fall of Rome, and this country is, some things are falling apart on much deeper levels than this president even recognizes. But we're also living at a time when a new world is struggling to be born. So my answer to your question is that he is not articulating, he is not 
compelling the, the American imagination to imagine what could be on the other side of this era. For that, we can't look to Joe Biden, but for a State of the Union speech, like I said, I got more from him than I expected. That's interesting. So, so yeah, I don't uh, necessarily agree with Marianne's commentary on the State of the Union being better than she expected. I thought it was you know, pretty bad as well. Uh, but I do totally agree with her point about nukes. And it's something that I feel is not being talked about enough. And I feel like the left should be more, you know, passionate, more, um, you know, aggressive in their resolve against nuclear weapons. She's absolutely correct to point out that, you know, a while ago, back in, you know, her youth, it was a big talking point among the left, the anti-war protesters. And it seems like a lot of people have just kind of given up now and, and it, it decided that, oh, it's not possible. Obviously, you know, countries aren't going to get rid of their nukes. We can't even bother to fight for that. Um, but I absolutely think it's still worth fighting for. And it's one of the big reasons why I've, you know, proudly voted for the Green Party in every presidential election that I was able to, uh, because they do put that, you know, front and center on their platform, the denuclearization. Yeah, look, and, uh, you know, nuclear disarmament, I think, is a radically under discussed issue in the progressive uh you know, whole policy world right now. Uh, I think it's just probably because mo most of the progressive uh, policy conversation is dominated around uh, Bernie Sanders 2016 campaign promises, which really opened up a lot of people's minds, you know, universal health care, uh, free college, um, things of that nature. And, you know, even Bernie, I don't really think had the uh, audacity to come out during his uh, presidency, probably because it would have been fucking horrible campaign uh, decision because people would have been shocked and he would have been smeared viciously for it. But uh, to come out and to start talking about nuclear uh, disarmament, I actually think that would be a great way for him to spend his, you know, twilight in the tenor years to start talking about something like that, maybe get together with some of the more like older anti-war guys uh, in the Senate, like, you know, maybe Bernie and Ed Markey could, you know, start giving speeches about that. Uh, but yeah, that's a hundred percent spot on from Marion Williamson. A lot of people in the chat are saying that she wants us to send U S military aid to Ukraine. If that's the case, I disagree with her on that. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was referencing at the beginning of this. It's like, I don't agree with Marianne Williamson uh, necessarily all the time. And I've actually been calling her out on Twitter as well for some of her takes where, uh, I mean, I get where she's coming from. I think her heart's in the right place, uh, but still her advocating for the escalation of this war in any, in any sense, in my opinion, is ill-advised because that is going to bring us closer to the brink of nuclear war. You know, us funneling money and arms into Ukraine is only going to bring us closer to that brink. So yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you, Brian. It is unfortunate. And thank you. Applejack is well, yeah, Marion's had tweeted about sending money to Ukraine that doesn't stop war and emboldens it. We need to back off on all sides, that Russian and NATO. So, yeah, you're 100% right. I agree with that. Uh, the only point I was making is that I thought she articulated that anti-nuclear sentiment really well. Uh, we need to hear more of that on the left. And she did a good job uh, bringing that to the conversation. But, yeah, I totally agree with you guys. Don't don't worry. Um, and also, oh, yeah, and thank you, Applejack, once again, Noam Chomsky, LOL, Noam Chomsky, said NATO isn't for defense against Russian expansion. NATO is to control the world's energy. Our hands are super dirty in pushing this war. Yeah, we've acknowledged that from the start. Thank you for the super chat, though. Really appreciate it. Yeah, and uh, I think Glenn Greenwald actually was the one that recirculated that clip of uh, Chomsky not that long ago, if you guys are looking for. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and also, just because we were talking about RT being censored, and removed from various platforms. This literally just uh, you know, came across my Twitter timeline, so I thought I would share this. Lee Camp says, my podcast, Moment of Clarity, has been removed from Spotify. Let it be known, you can do anti-women, anti-trans, or racist content on Spotify, but you can't be anti-war. That's not allowed. So not only is Lee Camp you know, talking about how his podcast has been removed from Spotify because it's associated with RT, also kind of taking some unexpected shots at Joe Rogan, he sounds almost like a, uh, almost just like one of these liberals, you know, clamoring for Joe Rogan's removal. Yeah, and let's not forget, Lee Camp's been on Joe Rogan's podcast, guys. He didn't have any quibs about it then, so we'll see about that. I'm just saying, um, and maybe he wasn't directly talking about Joe Rogan, but it's it sounds a, 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 like a. That was the vibe we all got. Uh, not that he's necessarily wrong. Joe Rogan is very, you know, transphobic, or at least he, I guess he doesn't even say transphobic. Anyway, never mind. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, wouldn't say, I wouldn't say Rogan. Uh, oh, yeah, anti trans. So I would agree that Rogan is anti trans. Uh, I don't think it's fair to call him racist or anti woman at this point. I think he's, you know, done the work necessary to absolve his past sins as far as, you know, not using racial slurs on his podcast and stuff. But it, it is true that to this day, he continues to platform transphobic viewpoints and make transphobic arguments. So he's correct in that sense. But yeah, definitely an unexpected uh, tone being struck there by Lee Camp. Although, 
uh, he's correct that, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy that they're not allowing his podcast to be on there. As far as what I've seen from Lee camp, I haven't been paying you know, complete and total attention to his commentary, but it seems like he's pretty on point as far as the whole Russia thing goes. So yeah, his uh, anti-war commentary is always usually so. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so there's a little update uh, and thank you by the way, Kevin, uh, for the 10 bucks coffee, on me guys thanks for your work thank you so much kevin really really appreciate that well absolutely use that money to get coffee uh yeah <laughs> but thanks so much for the super chat really appreciate the fact that you're enjoying the show um but yeah is there anything else you want to talk about zach um not really i mean god i just thought that we should all remind ourselves that uh, you know uh if anybody thought that joe biden was going to be moved to the left uh during his state of the union uh address we realize what we're in for for these long hard years coming uh forward i think that this spells absolute disaster for the midterms i think that him reminding everybody last night of what he didn't accomplish couldn't accomplish and won't accomplish uh on top of getting us involved in what could very much be a costly devastating war in terms of lives in terms of uh, the environmental degradation in terms of money obviously um and i think that it's going to be absolutely fucking disastrous for the democratic party in 2022 and they've deserved it they fucking deserve every bit of um else they take and they're going to take a lot of them and that's going to be bad for our country and that doesn't make me feel happy but that's what the fuck is going to happen do you think that uh this uh, again not re regarding your opinion on biden but do you think the ukrainian crisis and his handling of it will help or hurt him as far as his approval ratings go and as far as the democrats chances in the midterms um i still think it hurts him i still think it hurts him um in the long run i think that right now we're in the hype of it we're in the hype of it right now and it hasn't shot his approval rating up as much as it could have uh so i think it diminishes i think it i think it by the time he's up for re-election, that this Ukraine stuff is just like a a, a stain, a blunder, uh, something that the United States, we didn't care about beforehand. The media is making us all care about it right now. As soon as the media stops making us all care about it, I think his approval rating goes right back down when people realize they have it, that he hasn't meaningfully contributed anything to them. Uh, had he started, had this been the exact same war, but with China and Taiwan, uh, then I think it would have maybe helped him a little bit more. But I just, I don't know. I don't know. I just felt like people wanted to go with, I, I mean, who knows? Uh, but that's the vibe I get. Um, and then we did get this interesting super chat um, from JFL Productions. I'd be interested to hear t your take on this, Gavin, because this one's your favorite of the movies, I believe. Do you think, do you guys do left analysis on movies sometimes for fun? Uh, we do. Don't you think the Dark Knight trilogy is conservative? Bruce Wayne is reactionary and Bane is based. I mean, like, yeah, definitely Batman's a cop. That's, that's a, but I don't know if Bane is based. I, I'd have I think to it's referencing that. to the part in the Dark Knight Rises where he like lets all the inmates out of the jail at the end and they, they like flood the streets and shit. Um, I don't know if I would, I mean, maybe it's a little bit conservative. I never really interpreted it that way. Uh, I am a big fan of the Christopher Nolan Dark Knight movies, at least the the Dark Knight itself. I think there's some definite flaws with the uh, Batman Begins and the Dark Knight Rises. It's been a minute since I've seen either of them, to be honest. Uh, that being said, Zach and I are actually going to see the new Batman movie later this evening. Uh, so maybe we can do a analysis of that and its political meaning. Uh, but yeah, thanks for the super chat. Definitely an interesting question. I have heard some people talk about the uh, political undertones in Dark Knight Rises. Uh, I, I even saw someone saying that Christopher Nolan predicted the era that we live in now when he made that movie. So maybe I'll have to rewatch it and see what I think about that. Uh, but yeah, thanks so much for the question. It's definitely an interesting one. And like I said, I'm super excited to see the new Batman film tonight. It looks excellent. Uh, but thanks for the super chat. And thank you, uh, Applejack, once again, coming through. Dim or Repub, regardless it's bad for our country you're not going to find any disagreement from us there applejack we are you know staunchly anti-duopoly staunchly anti-republican and anti-democrat so yeah once again you're not going to find any disagreement from us there um but yeah the, the one thing i will say about biden's approval rating though is i do think this ukrainian conflict could likely help his approval not hurt it for a couple of reasons um, again, not because I'm particularly fond of his handling of the situation, but I have read polls that say that the majority of the American public is in favor of economic sanctions against Russia, but is not in favor of any sort of boots on the ground invasion. And so far, that basically has been Biden's policy. He remains committed to not sending any troops in. He reaffirmed that commitment last night in the speech. Um, and so far, there's basically just been economic warfare. So uh, again, not necessarily my handling of the situation, uh, but if you do look at what the people want according to the polling, that is on track with uh, you know how they're feeling. 
and you have to give him the benefit of the wartime presidency thing. Obviously, every president during wartime is going to go up in approval because, you know, people feel more patriotic. They feel more jingoist. They want to, you know, rally around their leader uh, because it's scary and they don't know who to trust or look to. Uh, so I, I very well think this could help him. I, I mean, I still think the Democrats are going to lose in the midterms. Um, but I do think that this might uh, kind of help move the conversation on from the the previous issues that were plaguing him. And, you know, now everyone's thinking about this. No one's thinking about gas prices as much anymore. No one's I mean, they are, but not that. The, yeah. But as far as the public conversation goes, as far as what's being talked about in the news day in and day out, uh, it seems like this is kind of dominating the conversation. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people just in my regular day to day life talking about the uh, gas prices. So that's anecdotal. I don't know if he's going to get the boom of the wartime president by the time that 2024 uh, comes around in the election cycle. If uh, he doesn't escalate, though, I mean, he would have to keep ratcheting up those sanctions in order for it to become a, a thing of public interest. I mean, the United States sanctions the shit out of all kinds of countries and it doesn't necessarily like uh, draw that wartime kind of, uh, but the know, media doesn't report on most of those conflicts the way they you are. Think this one report on it like this day in and day out until the election cycle. I, I mean, I have just, you paid I, attention to the way that their ratings have gone up because of their coverage of it? Yeah. And that would require him to escalate the tensions further. That's what I'm saying. There's no way that you can keep the public interest on this, uh, for three more years without anything else happening in the war without econ besides economic sanctions. I just, and I also think that the Republicans are going to have a great lane to come in, talk about gas prices, talk about the same thing that they were talking about with Donald Trump, which is we're wasting all of our money overseas. Uh, we're still, you know, sending weapons over there. We're still blah, 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 blah. Like who's to say for sure. But I, I just, I don't think this is going to be a W for Biden. I have to disagree with you on that one. I think his approval rating is going to go up because of this. I think it will successfully help him move beyond the conversations of the previous issues plaguing it. Not that those will be forgotten, but I just think that people's interest is on this. Now people are terrified of uh, nuclear war and, you know, to his credit, he is not sending troops in. He's not um, escalating militarily so far. So I think he might be rewarded for that. I genuinely do, especially if you compare it with the tone that Trump was striking, you know, going on Twitter, fucking doing his dick measuring contest. I have the I'm about to hit the button. I mean, that was not how people wanted to see these situations handled. That only made everyone more anxious. That only made everyone more scared. They did not feel reassured. And again, despite the fact that I think Joe Biden is a miserable president, um, you know, if you were listening to the speech last night and when it came to the Ukraine stuff, he did come off strong. Like he came off like he uh, was, you know, in charge or whatever. So I, I don't know. I, I think it will benefit his approval rating. Um, again, not that I like Joe Biden, obviously, but well, I guess I should ask you, how much do you think it'll benefit his approval rating? Because when I saw his approval rating, it was like 36 percent. Like, are we talking about it'll go up to like 48? Because I might concede that it'll go up to like 48. But I don't know if this will take him to like 58 percent approval rating or anything like that. No, I'm just saying it'll help. him. I'm not saying it's going to like dramatically turn the tides or anything. Well, you said wartime presidency, all those kinds of things. I mean, typically like Joe, George Bush, like got radically more uh, popular during the wartime. Right. And I mean, it's not going to be that much of a boost. I'm not saying he's going to go to like 90 percent approval rating like George Bush did. I'm just saying I do think it'll give him a bump in the approval rating and help him move on from some of the issues that were uh, really dominating the conversation and plaguing him when it came to his uh, approval rating. One of those being Afghanistan. You know, no one's talking about the Afghanistan withdrawal, which was really the first thing that, uh, you know, made his ratings decline in the first place. So uh, I, I do think this will help him. Again, that's not a good thing. I'm just, you know, giving my honest analysis of the situation. That's what I predict. We'll sure. see what happens. Yeah, um, no, I mean, I see where you're coming from for sure. I just, it, it, it'll be interesting to me to see if this all backfires for him. Right. I mean, and it's very unpredictable. We don't know what will happen because we don't know what Russia is going to do next. We don't know how this will escalate. Um, but anyway, that's just my prediction. Uh, to shout out a couple super chats. Thank you. John did not like Williamson's take on Biden's senility. Biden should get a break because... Most old people are senile. That's not ableist. That's scary. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. She was like, uh, I thought he, you know, she, they, they were talking about how he was like slurring his words or whatever. And she was like, you know, as an older woman myself, I, you know, don't really think it's as big of a deal or something like that. So yeah, I agree. It was kind of cringe, but whatever. Yeah. And it's also impossible to listen to your president when he sounds like that. I'm sorry, but it is. It, it doesn't exude leadership, you know? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the five bucks. Lick Skywalker. Uh, have you guys had any conversations slash debates with people who are suddenly psychotically pro Ukraine saying we need to help fight Russia? Yes, 100 percent. Yeah. No, it's it's pretty maddening when you're like, hey, I don't think we should go to war. And people are like, why are you apologizing for Russia? I'm like, I'm not apologizing for Russia. I am no fan of Russia or Putin. 
All I'm saying is that we should not be getting involved in this conflict as a country that exists on the other side of the globe and has no economic interests in the area anyway. Yeah. And it's, it always, it literally, if, and I don't know if you meant like political people, but if I'm just talking about people that I've discussed this with, it always seems like the narrative that the MSM, NBC has, or the mainstream media, I guess the MSM has been feeding everybody is Putin is Hitler. He wants to conquer the whole world. And if you disagree with them, then you are basically saying you're okay with Putin becoming the leader of the entire world. Um, so, but anyway, right. Again. 100%. Uh, thank you also, Kush Renata, for the five bucks. Really appreciate that. Uh, you know how low of a bar you have to set when you see your nation's main representative and think to yourself, well, he's cognitive and awake, lol. That is so fucking true. That is so, so fucking true. Now it's like, if Biden can get through a whole sentence, you're like, wow, wow. He's really wow. Awesome to me. <laughs> when, of course, if it was like, you know, Obama or something that that wouldn't even be a consideration. Obviously, he was far more articulate and people just took it for granted. Um, thank you also, Kush Renata. Uh, best thing Trump could do for his PR was lose to Joe. Uh, best. I don't know how that's a good thing for Trump's. He was PR. pissed as hell about that. Yeah. And, and it's just embarrassing. It's like if you can't beat Joe Biden, uh, Joe Biden was very beatable. Um, so to, to fail in that regard, I do not think was great for his PR. Um, and also, it just makes him seem like a whiny ass sore, like, you know, sore loser, because now he's running around talking about how he actually won the election when everyone that's not part of his cult is like, obviously, you didn't, bro. Take he's the L. Him and my pillow guy. Exactly. Exactly. It's just a cult. Uh, but yeah, thank you for the super chat. Um, thanks, John. Speaking of Batman, Batman Begins and Dark Knight came out uh, during George Bush's reign. I think it was supposed to be satirical of the bush era interest i'll definitely have to read some more think a little bit more about the political undertones in the dark knight trilogy it wasn't we should do a call-in about the po politics of batman sometime soon that would be fun as shit because i feel like you guys would have a lot to say about that as well yeah, totally that would be awesome um but yeah that's definitely interesting to think about i wasn't really uh, i never really watched them that way but I'll, I'll have to think about it some more also nolan's british and he's pretty apolitical so i think that the films may just kind of have whatever interpretation that um you know, we kind of present onto them, like just like broad kind of like, you know, myth, like, you know, uh, archetypal problems with the city, very batman -y. I don't know. When I look at Nolan, I don't necessarily think of the most political guy in the room, but that could also just be me. Yeah, for sure. Uh, thank you, Matt Ocelot. God, underrated action film. Shoot him up. Check it out. Will do, Matt Ocelot. Thanks for the recommendation. I never heard of that film, but I'll definitely take a note and look it up. Um, hysteric Raider, two bucks. Do you think we need a real Batman? LOL. Maybe if Batman was like fighting, like, you know, homelessness and poverty and out there like doing mutual aid or something, then I'd be down for that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Also, I just looked up that movie, uh, Shoot 'em Up, and apparently Paul Giamatti is the lead hitman in that movie, which makes me excited. Um, but yeah, as far as uh, needing a real Batman, Batman is a cop. I don't want any street vigilante. Yeah, but what I just said was we should have a Batman that just does like mutual aid and goes around uh, and, like gives homeless people like food and shit like that. That would be base. That would be one hundred percent what we need in the only Batman movie that I would support in real life. <laughs> the only Batman movie you would support in real life. Well, the only Batman character. I'm sorry. Way to bust up my balls about my fucking. Production. I was like, we're about to go watch the fucking new one tonight. <laughs> <laughs> anyway thanks for the question and also thank you applejack once again really appreciate the donation today i'm a jimmy door leftist but i won't uns unsub from you guys because i like some of your takes i can't follow takes uh kyle's takes anymore he has wild takes to me now i mean that's fair although to kyle's credit uh some of jimmy's takes have been pretty fucking cuckoo themselves and again you know jimmy loves to go after kyle these days he loves to shit on kyle uh, but he should be he should be lucky or should be glad that Kyle doesn't do the same for him because there's plenty of fertile ground there on which to attack Jimmy Dore. You know, the MPP stuff, continually apologizing for Nick Brana, obviously, uh, but also the, you know, edited article that Sean exposed. You know, Kyle could have gone after that. He chose to stay quiet. So how many leftist candidates have you supported that have spoken at CPAC? Zero from Kyle. <laughs> Uh, Tulsi Gabbard exactly yeah Jimmy doesn't exactly have the the uh, you know a pristine track record himself as far as uh his takes go in recent years but I get your point and yeah you know I I'm no simp for Kyle either he has he has his fair share of bad takes and we call them out on this show uh like we do everyone because you know people are like I'm a Kyle Kalinske leftist I'm a Jimmy Dore leftist or whatever I'm like I'm just a leftist that 
has opinions. I'm going to be honest about all my opinions, regardless of who they relate to. I'm not playing for any team. I'm not doing fucking PR for anybody. I'm not Jackson Hinkle over here doing PR for Nick Brana or Jimmy Dore. You know, that's not my fucking job. Uh, but thank you for the super chat. Also, Dark Halo. Uh, Bruce Wayne is a billionaire, a billionaire philanthropist. Uh, hashtag hero. Like I said, I would love to see a Batman doing like mutual aid, you know, answer in the call. Hassan Piker becomes Batman. No, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. Poof. Poof. Yeah. Uh, man, the left, the left is such, you always feel like you're on an Island. If you're, if you're being true to yourself on the left, because you're just like, everything is a shit show everywhere. Uh, that's why you have the Vanguard. Come hang out on Vanguard Island. Vanguard Island. Welcome to the Island, man. Island uh, boys. Yeah, we're island boys over here. <laughs> anyway, I think that just about wraps up our stream for today. Really appreciate the super chats, guys. Really, really appreciate the donations. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already uh, so you don't miss our next live stream. And make sure to hit that like button while you're at it to help promote us in the algorithm. Help us beat the censorious pro-corporate YouTube machine. That would be really appreciated. And of course, uh, we do like to start and end our live streams with a shout out to the patron community. So we'll do that right now. The link is in the description. If you guys would like a spot, a spot of your own on the shout out screen, hit up that link in the description. But yeah, we do like to shout out our patrons. Thank you guys so much for the support. Um, if you want to become a regular contributor, then you can hit up the link in the description. Like I said, it's a great way to support the show and the content we create. So if you enjoy the show, uh, please consider doing so. If not, like I said, though, just drop a like, hit that subscribe button, maybe consider sharing our videos with a fellow comrade, et cetera, et cetera. You guys know the drill. But thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Like I said, really appreciate it. And we'll see you guys later.